Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Jeffrey Epstein Show. I'm your host, Bobby Capucci, and this is Daily Drop number 287. Yesterday, we were talking about how the Public Corruptions Unit is overseeing the Ghislaine Maxwell case. This is the same unit that was overseeing the Jeffrey Epstein case as well. And we heard from a few ex-employees of the SDNY, a few ex-prosecutors and one uh, district chief who said that it was very irregular that something like this would be occurring unless one of the targets was somebody that was either A, in public life now, or B, used to work in public life. So... That kind of opens a door for people's minds to run, right? The speculation most certainly begins when you think about the public corruptions unit being in charge of the case. Now, me personally, I believe that that points to Florida and people like Barry Krischer and those who were in charge of the original prosecution of Jeffrey Epstein and the plea deal he eventually got. I think that the public corruptions unit is more than likely involved because there were some great uh, problems with what occurred, to say the least, okay? And probably some crimes were committed as well by government officials, when you look at what goes on, what went on here, and you look at the plea deal that Jeffrey Epstein and his named and unnamed co-conspirators received, well, you have to take a deeper look at what went on here. There is no doubt in my mind that there is something very sinister that went on in the negotiations between the state prosecutors, Barry Krischer and company, and Jeffrey Epstein's attorneys, Alan Dershowitz, Gerald Lef, uh, Gerald uh, Lefcourt, et cetera, et cetera. These are the kind of people that get into the back room and they start wheeling and dealing, don't they? And we know that people like Jeffrey Epstein get preferential uh, treatment over people like us. We know that. That's how it always works. So these lawyers get into the back room and it's easy for someone like Dershowitz to have a more of a uh, an impact on a conversation about a plea agreement with with Krischer if they're friends playing golf on a golf course or they have mutual friends or they run in the same circles or you get my meaning as opposed to you or I who has some personal uh, pu- I mean, some public defender who can't even afford to go play a round of golf, never mind go play with uh, uh, Alan Dershowitz or Barry Krischer. So they all have, you know, the seven degrees of separation going on, and they're all running in the same circles or have friends that run in the same circles. So it's much easier for them to finagle their deals, right? Wiggle out of a couple of uh, jams, get themselves off the hook. And I don't know how anyone could say anything else besides that occurred in Palm Beach when Jeffrey Epstein was first arrested and he was first tried. Our article tonight is going to go into that a little bit and talk about some of the players on the local scene and add a little bit of context to what I mean when I say that I think that if there is an angle for the public corruptions unit, which there quite possibly is considering they're in charge of the case, that I think that the angle is going to be something to do with Florida. And this article tonight from the Palm Beach Post from December of 2018, I hope we'll add a little bit of context and make you uh, see why I believe that Florida is going to be the focus, at the very least, one of the major focuses at the very least of the public corruptions unit. This, This article is from the Palm Beach Post. Headline, Epstein case first went wrong right here. The author of this article, Frank Sarabino. Palm Beach child molester Jeffrey Epstein got the spotlight turned on him again this week. 
The hedge fund billionaire's manipulation of the criminal justice system is only less stomach-turning than the way he used and abused scores of underage teenage girls for years for his sexual gratification. And I like the uh, the tone of Mr. Uh, Sarabino here right off the bat, right? Called him the Palm Beach child molester and uh, stomach turning. And that's always nice to see considering the way some people write about this guy. Some of those girls who are now in their 30s and still rightfully angry at Epstein, have come out of the shadows to speak to the Miami Herald. And now remember, this is from 2018. This is when the Miami Herald story first started to break, when they were first getting in, first digging in. This is, uh, this is what was transpiring at the same time over at the Palm Beach Post. The newspaper's comprehensive expose has focused on former U.S. attorney Andrew Acosta, who, while serving as the top federal lawman in South Florida, made sure that a 53-page sex trafficking indictment drawn up by his own FBI agents against Epstein was never filed. And it was egregious that Acosta would let himself be manipulated by anyone and forced into a deal like this. Because we know it wasn't Acosta who made the call. He's the point man, right? It's like you're the manager at a McDonald's, okay? That's basically what Acosta was and is. When it comes to a case like this, you think he has any lateral ability? Like, you think he's going to make this call without sending it up the the shaft for guys like Mukasey to take a look at? Of course not. But Acosta should have had the courage to say, hell no, what are you crazy? I'm not shelving this indictment. This is a sick, disgusting pedophile. This is a man that needs to be prosecuted. That's what a normal person would have done, right? But a rat bastard like Acosta, well, he's too much of a sniveling bastard prick to do something like that. He's more worried about his career and advancement and, you know, like we always talk about with so-called polite society. Instead, Acosta, who has been elevated to U.S. Secretary of Labor under President Donald Trump, worked with Epstein's lawyers to create a non-prosecution agreement that guaranteed immunity to any men or women who participated in Epstein's underage sex parties while also gifting Epstein with a shockingly lenient resolution to his crimes. And again, Acosta had to shoot this up the ladder. All right. He didn't have that kind of power. Not when it comes to a case like this. We're talking about a guy, Jeffrey Epstein, who was at the White House visiting Bill Clinton multiple times. People in D.C. knew who he was. It wasn't like this was some no name guy and they were going they were going to make an example out of him. This was, in Acosta's own words, an intelligence asset. What Acosta did was inexcusable. And the fact that he now runs a federal agency charged with exposing human trafficking and was recently held as a possible nominee to fill the vacancy of U.S. Attorney General makes things even worse. Now remember, again, folks, this article is from 2018, before Acosta was fired. And everything the author says here is is correct. It's inexcusable that he was running that agency, especially considering their job, one of their jobs is to expose human trafficking. Not an acceptable position for him to have. And the fact that Donald Trump's transition team and Donald Trump, who is the boss, right? The the buck stops with the boss is the way I feel. The fact that they went ahead with it and brought Acosta on, even though they knew the deal, it just shows a lack of of good judgment, folks, all right? That's really what it shows a lack of. Of all the people in the United States of America, Acosta was the only person qualified for that gig or the most qualified for that gig? Stop it. 
But the original villain in this story is former Palm Beach County State Attorney Barry Krischer. And here's where we're going to get into the meat and the potatoes of what I was taught, what I've been talking about since we uh, were talking about the public corruption angle, right? The Florida angle and what we got going on with Barry Krischer and this first prosecution is a huge huge deal as far as public corruption goes when we're talking about Jeffrey Epstein. Acosta shouldn't have been in the position to consider the Epstein case. Krischer got it first, and it was handed to the Palm Beach County prosecutor on a platter by the town of Palm Beach Police. To the department's credit, the town police treated Epstein's use of underage girls for his sexual gratification as the serious crime it was. And I've... I've definitely have always thought that the Palm Beach Police Department did a fantastic job. I I think that they did a really good job of trying to bring this to light. And in fact, it was the Palm Beach Police Department, remember, that escalated it above the state level and went federal with it. So I think the Palm Beach Police Department should be recognized for the good job they did here. And again, it was the of uh, the officials, the elected officials, the bureaucrats, you know, the jackasses behind the scenes who make everybody else look bad. The case started in 2005 with a 14-year-old girl from Royal Palm Beach High School telling the town police that she was lured with cash by another girl to go to Epstein's Brio Way home on Palm, uh, on Palm Beach where he got the girls to strip and give him lewd massages. And that was really the beginning of the end for uh, Jeffrey Epstein, right? When it comes to him being outed for the monster he was. Now... The legacy media and the other toads in so-called polite society, they knew, but they didn't care. But the fact is, this man was being outed in 2005 is when it all really began, when the first girl from the high school told the town police what happened. That was the beginning of all of Jeffrey Epstein's problems and his eventual downfall. Now, what happened between here, the first phone call, and Jeffrey Epstein passing away and dying of an alleged suicide? Well, that is the story that we've been digging deep into, right? There is so much to this story that it is so difficult to explain it in any truly deep contextual way to anybody who has not been following it. There's just so much to it. And that is one of the the craziest things about this story, in my opinion anyway, is that all of the people that were around Epstein who claim they had no idea what he was doing. That is the craziest thing to me. When in reality, we know that this dude was doing it since the 70s. He was that private about it, huh? Yeah, okay. I guess all the weird-ass stuff at his house, that wasn't a tell or anything, huh? The chess pieces that were carved into his employees naked on the chessboard, that's not weird. The picture of Bill Clinton in the dress, nah, that shit ain't weird either. The dildos all over the place, nope, not weird. I mean, come on. And then the people who have the audacity to act like even after he was convicted, like they had no idea or they had no idea how serious the charges were, are even worse. But the whole lot of them, all of these people that enabled Jeffrey Epstein, are absolutely disgusting. And the local prosecutors, Barry Krischer and his his crew, were right in the mix of it even though the Palm Beach Police Department warned them, even though the Palm Beach Police Department were adamant that they were dealing with a prolific sex trafficker and sex abuser, the local prosecutors and shitbird bureaucrats ignored it. Town police sifted through Epstein's garbage, finding evidence of multiple girls being recruited to pleasure him. 
After gathering enough evidence, police got a search warrant to Epstein's home. And in the search, they found more evidence, including naked photos of underage girls. After 11 months of investigating, the town police presented enough evidence to justify a multiple count indictment against Epstein on the charges of unlawful sex with minors. This should have been a news conference occasion to announce a significant indictment of a prolific sex criminal in our midst. Yeah, right? Why wasn't it? Why wasn't it, Barry Krischer? Why wasn't it? And still, these are the questions that have not been answered. This is one of the biggest injustices I have ever seen, ever Ever, ever, ever in my life, the way the prosecution went about things during this first time around, the first go around, when these girls came forward and said that they were abused by Epstein under the guise guise of going to give him a massage. But Krischer chose not to direct file charges in the case. Instead, his office presented the case to a grand jury, which meets behind closed doors and hears only the evidence the prosecutor decides to reveal. Yeah, that's not shady or shysty or anything like that. That's not, you know, disgusting. Especially considering when we're talking about Epstein and what we know now in hindsight, I can only imagine the bullshit that was being pumped into that grand jury room. And I hope beyond hope, that the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals overturns this plea agreement and unseals some of that grand jury testimony. Because let me tell you what, I can only imagine the bullshit Krischer and his office was in there talking about. Krischer's office presented evidence from just one of the girls, and the grand jurors obviously unaware of the scope of the case, decided to charge Epstein with a single misdemeanor count of solicitation of prostitution. And here is what I'm talking about with the public corruptions unit angle, folks. I think that what Krischer did in there might have been told some BS lies, right? Now, do I have direct evidence of that? I do not. I'm just trying to put the pieces together like everybody else here. But from where I'm sitting... The reason the public corruptions unit is involved and most likely is actively in charge of this case is for stuff like this. Because I have to tell you, without this happening, without Krischer giving Epstein all of this, this, this leeway and all of this love, the rest of this shit doesn't even occur because he's in prison on a federal charge on federal charges forever. That charge alone ought to turn your stomach. Imagine treating a girl who is too young to give consent as a prostitute rather than an underage victim of a sexual assault by an adult predator in his 50s. It's an absolutely revolting thought, isn't it? The fact that these guys would go in there and argue that this little these little girls were prostitutes and that they gave their consent and what happened was consensual to them, it is just mind-boggling to me. And I don't understand, honestly, I truly don't understand how this guy, Barry Krischer, and his team could possibly even do that. And to use the angle that their social media made them not credible, is just it just blows me away that this was allowed to occur. That's just another violation a slimy way to conf- con- uh, to confer a share of guilt on the victim, as if a cash transaction between an adult and a child somehow makes the sexual assault a misdemeanor rather than a felony. And there are people even on like Twitter that try and argue this. There are some sick, twisted people that will even try and argue, well, they got paid, right? Well, it makes them a prostitute. I mean, can you imagine of being that, black and white about things and not understanding nuance and not understanding what goes into sex trafficking and human trafficking and being so willfully ignorant that you would spew those sort of opinions on social media for the rest of the world to see. 
And I just personally, I don't understand it. I, I just don't understand it. I don't, you know, if a girl was in a tra- caught up in a trafficking ring, how could she possibly give her consent? How could she be a prostitute? It don't make no damn sense. Then Palm Beach Police Chief Michael Ryder was so outraged by the state's attorney's actions that he wrote a letter to Krischer asking him to disqualify himself from the Epstein prosecution. I continue to find your office's treatment of these cases very unusual, Ryder wrote. Ryder also complained to the FBI, asking the feds to take over the investigation, and the Bureau did, calling the Epstein's case Operation Leap Year. So that's what I was talking about a little bit ago about the local police. They went to the FBI. They were so distraught about how Krischer was handling this that they went to the FBI and got them involved. The FBI uncovered more evidence of Epstein's exploitation of girls, not only in Florida, but in other places in the, in the United States and South America where he recruited girls as young as 13 for his sex parties on his private island and on his plane, dubbed the Lolita Express. That's when Acosta stepped in, and like Krischer, took better care of Epstein than his victims. And again, who was directing Acosta? That is something nobody ever talks about. It can't just stop at Acosta, right? Acosta played his role, and he played it well for the part that he was given. But he was not the be-all, end-all here, folks. He didn't have that kind of power. And it goes up. We have to look all the way up to the top of the food chain. And sitting at the top of that food chain was Michael Mukasey at the time. Krischer is now trying to rewrite his role in the case as a noble one. That he is just passing the case along to the feds because they had a stronger case. The case we had was not as serious as the one the feds had developed with him transporting young women in a plane across state lines, he told the Palm Beach Post this week. But that's, ju- but that's, that's just a dodge. And also, didn't Dershowitz say that the state had a better case as opposed to the feds? Man, there sure is a lot of lying going on around here. In the end, Epstein was allowed to plead guilty to two state charges of soliciting a prostitute and procuring a person younger than 18 for prostitution. Part of the deal was an 18-month prison sentence and a lifelong designation as a sexual predator in the state of Florida. But that turned out to be a mockery of justice. Epstein didn't do hard time in state prison as a child molester. No. Under Palm Beach County Sheriff Rick Bradshaw, Epstein was allowed to have his own private wing in the Palm Beach County Stockade. It was basically his private hotel, one he got to leave six days a week and most of the time. And we've talked about that at length, the special favoritism that Epstein received while he was quote-unquote incarcerated. Do me a favor. Next time any of you get convicted of a state felony, call up Bradshaw and tell him that instead of you being shipped off to Stark, you'd like him to make your private wing of the stockade ready for your arrival, and that you plan to spend just eight hours a day there. Let me know how that conversation turns out. And he's basically saying, the two-tier justice system is on display for everybody to take a look. All right, if you or I were to get in trouble, your Uncle Jeff, your Uncle Mike, your Aunt Susan, well, they're not going to get hooked up at the stockade. They're getting shipped right the hell off, and they're being put right into general population, and whatever happens to them, happens to them. There's no, I'm going to the blockade, and I'm only going to be there eight hours a day. There's none of that shit. A couple of months before serving his sentence, Epstein formed a company called the Florida Science Foundation, which set up an office on Australian Avenue in West Palm Beach, Florida. Under a special arrangement, he was allowed to check out of the the county stockade for up to 16 hours when he allegedly would go to work six days a week at this newly formed foundation and be in the company of others there. And we know from reports now that while he was out, 
on these little uh, jaunts where he's supposedly at work, he was abusing girls in other states, other places, being involved in all sorts of scumbaggery. Then after serving 13 months of his 18-month sentence in this fashion, he was released and supposedly on probation at his Palm Beach home where his movements would be restricted. But that was another mockery of justice. He got travel permits to make weekly trips on his private jet to New York and his private island in the Virgin Islands. Imagine that, huh? Imagine you trying that? Even though other parolees are supposed to get limited time one day a week to go buy groceries, Epstein would log out of his Palm Beach home for long stretches of time, claiming in one instance to shop at Home Depot from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m., and at another time to spend five and a half hours at a local sports authority store. Oh yeah, okay, uh, five, at, five and five and a half hours at a sports authority store? What are you doing there for five and a half hours? Four hours at Home Depot? And nobody checked in on it. Nobody called him out on it. Nobody gave a shit. When Palm Beach police found him walking around Palm Beach one day, apparently in violation of his probation, no action was taken. Why would it be? He lived by a set of rules that you and I cannot imagine, folks. And his life was absolutely protected by his friends like Barry Krischer and others. Epstein survivors have filed multiple civil suits against him and some of them still hold out hope for justice one day, which includes vacating his plea deal and sending him to a Florida prison. A real one this time. And remember, this was written before he died. This would all be unnecessary if Epstein got what he deserved when the Palm Beach police took its case to Krischer 12 years ago. Instead, Krischer became the first of Epstein's many protectors. Maybe one day, we'll find out why. And look, it is goes right in to what I was talking about with the public corruptions unit. So... With it being a relatively slow news day in the case, I thought that this would be a great article to add and put a little more meat on that bone, right? A little more context. So you have an understanding and an idea of why I say that Florida is in the crosshairs when it comes to public corruption. If you'd like to contact me, you can do that at bobbycapucci at protonmail.com. That's B-O-B-B-Y-C-A-P-U-C-C-I at protonmail.com. You can also find me on Twitter at B-O-B-B-Y underscore C-A-P-U-C-C-I. All of the links that go with this episode can be found in the description box. All right, everybody. I'll be back tomorrow. Hope you all have a great evening.